Good morning, and thank you for joining us for week 11 of our COVID webinar series, which kind of feels like the series that never ends. Uh, a few items that I'd like to remind you of. We will continue to send out email blasts updates every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. However, as was previously mentioned, if we have information that's timely to share on Tuesday and Thursday, we'll still go ahead and push out a blast, just like we did yesterday. Um, just know if you don't see one on Tuesday and Thursday, um, we're, we're on that Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. Also, just a reminder, please continue to submit your stories from the field and to recognize your frontline heroes. And lastly, if you don't already follow us on Facebook and Twitter, um, our Twitter handle is at mdisabilities. We encourage you and your, we ask you to encourage your family to follow us there as well. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Val. So I am not Val. <laughs> um, Val had to jump off on something else. So we're gonna go out of order this morning. Hi, this is Gary Schantzmeyer. Um, first, I'm going to handle a question we got um, on a stimulus payment. Can we get clarification? We are being told they cannot be used for room and board costs. Um, what would be needed? Um, why would that be if needed to pay bills? So the stimulus payment is available for, for things that are a, a normal liability of the consumer. And if room and board, if they have a liability for room and board, that the stimulus payment if for some reason they don't have other resources, the stimulus payment can cover that. So it is for their normal um, liabilities. After that, um, I have some frontline hero stories. Um, it is my pleasure to read. The first one is Sonia, works in St. Louis. Uh, so through everything, Sonia shows up to work, keeps an upbeat and positive attitude. She jumps in as a role model and shows the DA staff that she will do the same as she is asking them to do. In a time of need, she has come in on extra shifts to help things run smoothly. During all of this, she still takes time to remember her staff and have that staff have lives outside of work and has been helping them find job opportunities for family members currently unemployed. So thank you, Sonia. Sycamore works in Kansas City. We want to recognize staff working in a home in Kansas City, including Sycamore, where multiple individuals tested positive um, for COVID-19. These staff, so it, this is for all the staff at Sycamore. These staff provided critical care for all nine individuals in the home during this very difficult time. Staff moved into the home and shared shifts working tirelessly so we could isolate the home, prevent further spreading of COVID, and keep everyone safe. The staff completed frequent monitoring of symptoms and had to support individuals as they went in and out of hospitals, had to call 911 a few times, and never gave up. They're keeping the home clean, following protocols from the health department, and policies that our agency has put in place. They're doing everything they can provide, they can to provide care and doing a great job. Despite all of the difficult things they've encountered, they have not given up and keep coming back to make sure the individuals are safe and cared for. These staff have given up their own time and regular schedules right now to be with the individuals at Sycamore and are making great sacrifices and doing an excellent job. Thank you, thank you for those staff. Um, Regina works in St. Louis. Regina has maintained communication for both facilities related to HR issues. She's been a nonstop working machine. Thank you, Regina. And we also can't forget the, the folks in HR and the other folks, because uh, right now, you know, personnel is such an issue. So those, those folks are, are critical as well. And with that, I will turn it over to Angie. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I am really excited this morning because at 922, we received our approval from CMS on our Appendix K. So um, that has been several weeks coming. So I'm excited about that. And I'll tell you a little bit about it. The waiver is in effect from January 27th, 2020 through January 26th, 2021. There has been some language revisions um, since our initial submission, but most of it was clarity but there are a few things. So I wanna go over some of those differences with you this morning. So I'll go through the differences from what you saw on our original submission and then what you will uh, see with the approved submission. Um, we did add that pre-vocational services may be provided in an individual's home. And we also added language that services may be provided in any setting necessary, such as the alternative, as a state alternative care facility. This is really due to hospital overflow that we may incur. Um, and so they could go to another hospital, they could go to an emergency shelter. 
um, things like that to be able to ensure their health and safety needs. We did have to remove the suspension of participant rights for allowing visitors and access um, to the community going through due process. Those are not items that are approvable through Appendix K. They can be requested through um, an 1135. And, so, and we'll go through the 1135 information here in a little while. Um, they did require, uh, CMS did require us to add that the state in the person-centered planning section, that the state will ensure that the ISP is modified to allow for additional supports and services in response to COVID-19, and that the support coordinators must submit the request for those additional support service, supports and services, as well as the date of the verbal consent, um, no later than 30 days from the date the service begins. So that was um, language that they just had us add this week. So again, that those ISPs must be submitted within 30 days from the date that the service begins, and that would include the date that the verbal consent was provided. So make sure that's documented. And we'll talk a little bit more about verbal consent in the 1135 update that I'll provide here in just a second. We um, removed language allowing for notification and entry of the DMH, the DD um, defined reportable events to be reported outside of the next business day notification and entry requirement. So that was removed. We were able to keep allowing certain waiver services during individual's hospital stay in the event that the hospital was unable to provide the service, but CMS did require that we add that these waiver services could not substitute services that the hospital is obligated to provide under federal or state law or any other applicable requirements, and they must be designed to ensure a smooth transition from the hospital to HCBS settings to preserve the individual's functional needs and abilities. We also removed adding medical supplies and equipment and appliance above what state plan covers. Once we started digging into what that definition would be, we really figured out that it's already captured in our specialized medical equipment and supplies definition. So we were okay there. And we're gonna work on getting this approval posted on our um, COVID site, um, along with any updates that we need to do pro for provider guidance um, that we've, that we've um, posted previously. Also, and I did not realize this last Friday because we have not received the official letter, but it is posted on CMS's website. They did approve additional um, flexibilities through our 1135 waiver request, our original one that we sent back in March. Um, so they posted on their website on May 14th some of these flexibilities for HCBS settings and our targeted case management services. So the first flexibility to share is that CMS is um, temporarily allowing our waiver services to be provided in settings that have been added since March of 2014 and not determined to meet the HCBS rule um, to accommodate when an individual requires relocation to an alternative setting to ensure con continuation of needed HCBS services. So that's a lot of, a lot of word, that's, that's CMS wording. Um, so what does that mean for us? Basically what I already mentioned in the Appendix K is that we can expand waiver services to be provided in settings like in hospitals or hotels or shelters or schools or churches when it's necessary due to that COVID impact. Um, thankfully, we have not seen this happen yet in Missouri, so um, we're doing okay there, but it is in place in case we need it. CMS is also granting, has also granted the authority to permit us to temporarily waive the written consent under the person-centered planning by allowing that documented verbal consent as an alternative to individuals and the provider signing the plan and, doc and all those documents that are included as part of the plan. So this is something we've already been doing. I know it's, it's uncomfortable and it's odd because this in the past, but it's okay now officially to document that verbal consent of the individuals and the providers for that plan. And again, going back to Appendix K, these changes would need to be submitted within 30 days of the, the change. With the 1135, these approvals are in effect from March 1st, 2020, and they do terminate upon the termination of the public health emergency, including any extensions. Um, and they've reiterated that in no case will any of these waivers extend past the day of the public health emergency. So for us, our targeted case management services are state plan. Um, some of these HCBS rules are state plan, but it bleeds over a little bit to our Appendix K. So we will balance that out when, when the public health emergency ends, and we will continue to work with, with providers on, on how that will all wrap up in the end. 
Um, so then I'm excited to share some stories from the field and some frontline heroes. So we've got one that's kind of called Pay It Forward, and I think this is pretty cool. This is um, an individual um, that has received a painted, he received a painted canvas on the doorstep that said, you are so loved with a side note, with a note inside offering encouragement through the times of quarantine. So then that individual um, was really happy with that, and then they painted a canvas themselves, and they paid it forward and placed it on a neighbor's front step. So definitely paying that forward, and that's, that's pretty cool. Perfect during a time like this. Um, Frontline Heroes. Terry works in St. Louis. In addition to performing her full-time duties as a DMH surveyor, Terry is not really without staff who support clients at the center. Additionally, I'm a cheerleader for the entertainment of her fellow surveyors during the current pandemic. So thank you, Terry, just for your positivity and helping others out um, in a difficult time. Paula works in Columbia. Paula works with two individuals who usually spend their days at a, a day program. And because of the pandemic, the individuals are home instead of out in the community. So Paula has worked with both of them to make sure that they're staying active and enjoying their extra time spent at home. They've done multiple crafts, completed science experiences. This one sounds good, experience. Completed science experiences with Skittles, played games, and put together all kinds of puzzles. She helped one of the individuals purchase a Roku so that she could enjoy Disney Plus. Paula has also helped out in several other houses when staff was short. She's helped secure extra PPD and supplies in the community and found people who could help make masks. They are very lucky to have Paula on their team. And I think all of these workers, we're all very lucky and blessed to have them um, working with us every day. So thank you all very much. And with that, I will turn it over to Kim. Thanks, Angie. Good morning, everyone. Just wanted to touch base real quickly with everyone about some, some exciting things that are happening state right around community testing. Um, as hopefully all of you are aware, one of the pillars right now that's supporting the Governor Show Me Strong recovery plan is around rapidly expanding testing capacity and volume across the state. Within the division, we're initiating some efforts and we've already reached out to some of our contracted residential providers who support individuals in group home settings, just collecting information on what your current testing needs might be for both participants and staff who provide support services. Um, we're gonna be reaching out next week to some of our contracted ISL service providers to collect some of the additional information as well. What this means is once we're able to collect that information and the division receives notification that we have the ability to access additional testing um, to support those efforts, then we'll be contacting you and trying to coordinate um, with you respectively. So we kind of be looking for that correspondence and that's what that is um, supporting in regards to those efforts. I have a story from the field to share with everybody. Um, last or earlier this month, it was Nurses Week, and this was submitted by Austin Dooley, which is one of our service provider agencies. For Nurses Day, they decorated the sidewalk with sidewalk chalk of um, the homes where they were providing services, and they hung up signs to show their love for all that their nurses do. Um, and they also received a nothing but bunt cake tower to show their appreciation, which sounded pretty cool. So hats off to those nurses. And then a couple of stories also from our frontline heroes that um, are also related to nursing personnel. So this one is out of St. Charles area. Veronica, they said, was a hard, is a hardworking nurse and that she's given more of herself than they can imagine. Um, she tirelessly works at the isolation home. So apparently they're supporting some individuals who um, have some needs there on several occasions with a smile on her face and a professional attitude. And they, they said that Veronica understands the individual's needs and she's always willing to jump in and support, and they felt that she is definitely a hero. So great recognition for, Ron, for Veronica. And then lastly, Penny um, works in Poplar Bluff. Penny is an LPN too, and she comes with years of mental health experience. Um, this writer indicated that she's new, but they were excited to have her join and be a part of their team, and they are looking forward to working with her um, long-term. They said that she's always smiling and eager to help, and they wanted to welcome her aboard and, and indicated that she is a frontline hero. So again, we just want to recognize all of our frontline heroes out there, um, our nursing personnel, our direct support professionals, our provider agency staff, 
our regional staff, um, everybody has just stepped up and is, has done such a wonderful job. So thank you everybody for all that you're doing. And I'm gonna turn it over to Wendy. Good morning, everybody. I'm taking a question that came in from our Deacon Dale and it um, reads, is the expedited UR process being used in all instances or just COVID staffing situations? What is the expectation slash time frame on receiving authorizations for ongoing plan and, and amendments? The expedited UR is only intended for use with the COVID um, related changes to programs and services and you should not um, expect any changes with the time frames in approving um, plans through the regular annual plan process or the annual the regular UR process. There's been no changes made to that. So that should continue as usual. Um, I'm going to do a couple other questions here while we're waiting and hoping Val can um, jump back with us. Um, there have only been nine positive cases in our county. None are currently active. We've not had any new cases in weeks. Some county providers have resumed all services. Is there a mandated timeline for TCM providers to resume face-to-face -face contact with individuals or can this be a county decision? It is a county decision. We are not mandating any time frame um, or timeline by which you can do that. You're really going to have to take into consideration the activity of the virus in your county and the surrounding areas where your staff may be coming from if you have staff living in um, surrounding counties. So that needs to be considered as, as well. In the stories from the field call today, we had one TCM provider said that they were actually doing um, uh, modified site visits by at least driving to um, the individual's home and then um, they're, they're seeing them there come out into the driveway and they can at least have a visual and lay eyes and talk with them um, from a distance and, and then they're doing kind of a face-to-face -face visit that way. So that is something also really, I think, cool to consider. Um, I'm going to move on, Val's back, so I'm gonna move on to my stories from the field and let her finish up those other questions. Um, I have a story from Austin Dooley and it's called Facebook Family Updates. Keeping, your family, keeping our families informed and updated regarding our agency's COVID-19 response has been incredibly important. We established an ADC Updates for Families private Facebook page and invited our guardians and family members to join. This is a great page where we share what we are doing to keep the individuals and team members safe during the pandemic. We are also able to share pictures and videos with the families where they can see how individuals are spending their day. It's been an invaluable, it has been invaluable as a means of communication and reassure ADC families during these unprecedented times. That's a really great idea and way to stay connected. So thank you, Austin Dooley. And a couple frontline heroes. Shelly P works in St. Louis. Shelly has remained true to the gentleman she has worked with for a long time, which includes um, sticking with them when they become ill and need greater support. She has been a strong support and continued to work through a time of grief for the team as well. She, she works extra shifts and asks, extra shifts asked of her to assure continuity of care. So thank you so much, Shelly. And one more is Tierra S who works in Poplar Bluff. Tierra has stayed over and worked doubles when needed. Tierra, Tierra has created games to keep the consumers engaged and cooked full and well-balanced meals for them. Thanks, Tierra, for all that you're doing down there in Poplar Bluff. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Val. All right. Thank you, everybody. Sorry I'm late. Sorry if I say something that's already been said, but if I say it, it must be really, really important, right? Um, I don't know how many of you in the state today got to see some sunshine this morning. We did get the bright yellow ball for about an hour and a half here in mid-Missouri, so we were happy to, it's gone now though, so we're back to normal gray. Um, yesterday, the governor had a really huge announcement about increasing COVID-19 testing volume in the state of Missouri. And I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna try not to cry when I do it because we are so excited about that. And for us in the division, this started on August 6th when we had a resident that we needed, we knew we needed to get tested. We had positive contact exposures to him. And until he exhibited symptoms, we were not able to get that test done. And then in order to get that test done, we had to take him from the facility to a clinic to get that test done. Then it took us two days to get those test results. 
And by that point, it was April 8th, and he passed away on April 9th. And at that point, it got real. So I am so excited now that we are testing symptomatic and asymptomatic folks. That is not That decision was a decision based on supply and the ability of labs to access tests. So I'm not saying that... Um, that anybody was wrong and how that decision has materialized, not at all. I know all the ins and outs of that. But we are now to a point where testing in the state of Missouri is pushed to a whole new level. So symptomatic and asymptomatic folks can access tests. And if any of you were out there trying to access tests, you understand those challenges. But we have access. There are three parts to testing. There is access to test kits. There's access to lab capacity. And there's access to people that can perform those tests. And you've got to have all those things really working well together in order to get testing done and testing done correctly. So, so excited about that. And I just want to give you a little bit more about what Governor Parsons said on the testing front yesterday. So we, our goal in Missouri is to get up to 7,500 tests a day. Right now in the state, we average about 3,750 tests a day. So we're looking at trying to double our testing capacity, not double our capacity, but double the number of tests actually being completed in the state of Missouri. And Governor Parson is very committed to working to make sure that our vulnerable populations are protected and continue to be protected as we move forward and as the economy and the state, both socially and economically, open up. So that's where this, we all have got to be working together on this testing front. Um, and we have to, we still have to be kind of methodical in how we do it, but there's also some other opportunities available. So what's going on right now with the state facilities and what I see going on in the future with our community providers is kind of what I want to talk about right now. So we started testing all of our staff at state operated facilities, whether those are, for, for us at the Department of Mental Health, that's all of our psych hospitals and all of our habilitation centers. The plan varies a little bit for the Division of Youth Services, for the Department of Corrections, and for the Missouri Veterans, because we all don't look the same either. But for the department, but we will eventually get all of our residents and all of our staff tested. Um, in the next 10 days, the Department of Mental Health will be doing 600 tests on average per day. When this is over, we will have, by, by May 31st, we will have completed over 6,000 tests, and that will be all of our staff in our state-operated facilities. Um, I know people are scared about testing. Um, there's apprehension around just actually getting the test done. Nobody wants to stick it up their nose. I get that, but it's important to do this testing. Um, there's apprehension about the results we're going to get back when we do this testing. I will tell you, when you get the baseline result of what's going on in your facility, the way that you can plan or with your residents or any of the way you are operating, you can then begin to plan how you reopen. You can then begin to better react to when you have a positive staff or resident that you are working with or supporting. You know that on X date, I didn't have any positives. Now I do. You will be able to do so much more with this information that right now you don't have. That's why testing is important. That's why we've got to get everybody tested or as many people tested as we possibly can especially over the next few months, and that's what we're going to really, really, really be working on. So that's part of what the governor's announced, and there's ways to do it. There's the baseline way to do it, then we'll do some ongoing, what we kind of call sentinel testing, where we'll do some sampling testing in our facilities and with our, our residential providers and with our uh, community providers, all of those folks, just so that we have an idea of what's going on in the community. It's, it's worth so much information to have. And I know it's scary. What do you do if six people end up positive? Well, you, you adjust, you adjust, but what do you do when someone passes away? And, and that's not something I want anybody to have to go through if we can avoid it. So that's testing, facility type testing, congregate living type testing, that's testing there. Um, also what we're working on, same thing with the nursing homes. And right now, over the next five days in the nursing homes, they will be due, well, they're averaging 1,850 tests per day, and I actually don't have their total over the next five days. I'm sorry. But um, they plan on getting 50 long-term care facilities, all residents and all staff tested next week it, within five days. Um, so that is also a huge lift. And then we will also be doing community sampling across the state. And I know you guys are familiar with some of the community sampling efforts that have occurred. And those community sampling efforts were really limited to those areas, whether that be a certain zip code or a certain county. The state is going to announce today another community sampling effort. 
And that community sampling effort will be open to any Missouri resident, whether or not they are symptomatic or asymptomatic. And I hope the counties are in here. Yes, in Boone, Cape Girardeau, the locations will be Boone, Cape Girardeau, Green, Jackson, Jefferson, and St. Charles County. Those, are, those counties were picked because they tend to be hub areas for healthcare, so people are familiar with accessing those counties to get healthcare type services. And the goal will be to do 970 tests throughout those community sampling efforts every day. There's also some smaller counties that will be participating more on a county-wide basis, but we, and we will continue to make sure that you all have all of this information. But please, please, please be taking uh, notice of these opportunities. And if you're really looking for what is my civic duty to do in the pandemic, right now that civic duty is to get tested and understand if you're positive, if you're negative, so that you have some information. The other thing I wanted to share about testing is they are also planning to do 9,000 test collection kits through the St. Louis Region Task Force, and that will also be happening, happening as a separate effort from the community sampling. So I don't want people to think St. Louis is left out. They are not. They just have their own, um, they've, they've been at this longer than the rest of us, and they've got their own path, their own way to get things done. So. Um, that is where we are at on testing. I, like I said, I can't, testing matters. I can't say it enough. I've been, I've been on my soapbox about testing mattering since the end of March. And I truly believe that it has made a difference in our facilities when, when we have been able to test. Just to give you an idea, in one of our facilities, 50% of the people that we have tested in that facility that have been positive have been asymptomatic. They had no idea they were carrying the virus at all. So there's still so much we don't know about the virus. We don't know how long it's live. We don't know how long it's contagious. We're learning all of those things as we go. And again, that's another reason why testing is so important. If you don't know, I mean, I'm really, really pretty passionate about testing. So, and I'm really passionate about getting all of our folks tested and I hope we can get that done over the course of this year and in some sort of rhythm where it makes sense for us to start re rejoining uh, society and being part of the economy like everybody else. Um, there's some really strict rules that are coming down from the CDC on what's expected for long-term care. And one of those is that all residents and all staff at any long-term care facility have got to be tested before they can even start to presume to open up. So I don't know that we're quite that, I don't know where we're at on that. And that's something the state's gonna be looking at over the next week, but um, it is really a key to any sort of reopening. So I wanna make sure people understand that. Um, okay, so I'm really confused because that's on the back side. Um, okay. So I have some papers here, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's really our fusion cell update too, is our testing update. Uh, we continue to monitor counties north of I-70, Buchanan County, Andrew County, Audrain County, Sullivan County, Gentry County, Adair County. Am I missing any of them? I might be, but we do continue to monitor those counties. We did, the state of Missouri did roll out a new dashboard this week, which we've shared out and we can continue to share that. We can actually post that to our website too for people that are interested. That dashboard shows your seven-day case total, your 14-day case total, percent of growth, really important factors that you need to know as you are looking at how you re-enter communities, okay? So um, please take a look at that. I, I'm a data nerd, so I really love it. I love, I love being able to look at that, and it's a county view, so it's really, really easy to see and understand, I think. Uh, they did a really good job on that. Um, budget update, it's not good guys. I cannot be, I, like I said last time and maybe on a different call, I do this a lot. I cannot tell you, that I've never seen it like this and I've been through two different recessions. Um, it, it's fast, it's furious, we don't know when it's gonna recover. There's so much that we don't know. And without really solid guidance from the federal government on what they're gonna help us with or what they're not gonna help states with, and I'm not saying I endorse or don't endorse that, but without knowing if there's gonna be money coming from the federal government to the states, um, I can tell you that uh, it's gonna be really, really difficult to plan. And our fiscal year starts July 1. So if the federal government makes a decision on August 1st, we've already implemented some stuff that might be pretty rough. It doesn't mean we don't undo some things, but it doesn't mean we have it doesn't mean we haven't had to start implementing things. So their action is really important to how we move forward. To give you kind of an idea for those of you that are have been around me a long time, um, you know, and are familiar with our Medicaid reimbursement process, 
the federal government has this thing called the federal matching percentage. And so states pay a percent of our Medicaid costs and the federal government pays the percent of those Medicaid costs. The federal government increased all states federal matching percentages in the first round of the uh, federal aid to states by 6.2%, which was huge and that gave the state a lot of money, which ga it gave the state, it filled in some revenue holes for the state. I wanna say it gave us a lot of money. It filled in revenue holes for the state and that was really important so that we didn't have to start doing cuts early. But to put that into context, when we were in the Great Recession last time, our FMAP percent was closer to 18% increase for the state of Missouri, not six. So the last time we had a recession, the federal government really did put a lot more revenue into our state, or which allowed us not to have to cut as many things. And right now that is still at 6.2%. Now that is part of some of the packages we've seen out there floating around to increase that even higher. Um, but we just wanted to make sure that you guys understand I don't want to make any, I, I've been cutting budgets for 20 years. I don't want to do it anymore and I don't have a choice. And it is not going to be pleasant. It is going to be painful. We're all going to feel it. So, um, but please know we, we and, and people will say we don't care and people will say we don't understand and people will say, how could you do that? And there is only so much money there and we are a part of a big system that has to access that money. A deer just ran through the field. Sorry, seriously. <laughs> oh, a deer's a deer's gracing our, our our yard here in Jefferson City. So that's kind of nice. See, life goes on even when you talk about bad budget news. Um, I've got a couple of questions here. I was going to uh, work look to. So, is there a way to know if a provider is successfully registered on the marketplace? What I would suggest you do, and we've given, we've put out, but we'll send out again. There is an email address that you can use to act to send questions about the marketplace to. So we'll get that out there again so that people can send their questions to that email address. But that is the best source of finding out information about Marketplace that I have at this point in time. Um, there's a question, I'm getting contradictory answers as to whether I have to pay all my employees hazard pay. First of all, anytime you do hazard pay, that is your business decision. We have not directed state agents, any of our community provider partners to do that. We as a state, this is, I will tell you how we as a state do hazard pay. So until a facility has a positive, either resident or staff, nothing changes with the pay structure for the employees with that facility. As soon as they have a positive resident or staff, employees that are coming to work, that means they do not do no-show uh, type activities, those employees get an extra $250 a pay period. Also, any employee who works directly with a positive resident gets an extra $6 an hour. That is how we do it in the state facilities, um, but that is not how you have to do it in the private facilities. That is your decision as a private provider. I recognize that that is not built into your rate, and we continue to talk to folks about the fact that you that is not built into your rate to support people, just like cost of testing is not built into your rate to support people, excessive overtime is not built into your rate to support people. Um, all of that's not built into your rate. I recognize that and we are working to try to identify solutions to help support our providers, but at this point in time, we don't have those. So, um, and with the budget being what it is, we will have to find alternative sources to make that work and there'll be competition for those alternative sources too. Okay, now there's a backside of a paper. Why is it still taking a week to get results? Is that on testing? testing. Okay, and it's going to vary on which lab you use. I have learned so much this week. <laughs> so we actually have um, a state contract. The state has a contract. So if you're a governmental entity, you can access our state contracted labs. And we've got some information out there around those. But it will depend on what lab you use. So you need to, when you are identifying labs to use, one of the questions you should ask is, what is your turnaround time for results? Um, another question we came across this week as we're working with some labs to get our testing done for all of our residents was, okay, can you turn this around? Because we'd like to see at least 24 hours, we will accept 48 hour lab turnaround. Um, can you get this done in 48 hours? We're like, well, we think we can. If we can't, we ship them out of state. So that's not an ideal lab for us to work with at this point. So while they may be a lab that we need to work with in terms of us identifying a lab we wanna work with, they'll go to the bottom of the list. 
Um, so just ask your labs these kind of questions and that, that should help you um, understand their capacity to get results to you quickly. Um, and then any DMH flu shot, oh, hard can, can, can DMH make flu shots mandatory? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I'm thinking no. We do make it mandatory for our some of our employees, and um, but I'm not sure that I had that ability to do that with the community providers. But um, we'll 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 look into what we can and can't do there. So um, is that any other questions? Just so you know, I saw 435 people on the call when I went over to look at the questions. Um, I'm sorry that Angie Brenner was cutting out. Um, we're gonna make her stand on a roof next time. She does that sometimes when she talks to us too but the clouds are rolling in, so I understand why she opted not to. Director Stringer, would you like to say anything to our Friday WebEx folks? Uh, uh, just wanna, I just wanna thank everybody for all the hard work um, that you're doing. Uh, you know, our, our, our business is a tough business, even during good times. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we have trouble with staffing. We have trouble, uh, we, we do everything we can to keep people safe, staff and the people that we serve. Uh, this virus has, of course, made it exponentially harder. And so um, um, I just I just appreciate all you're doing. We will help you in any way that we possibly can uh, to get through this. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Gary. So the testing at facilities that we're doing was not a CDC nope. issued, it was a state decision. It was that a was state a question decision, on the, yep. yeah. No, it was a state decision. Governor Parson made the decision. Um, I will say though, the CDC and the guidance that they put out around long-term care facilities reopening, that guidance says, now it's guidance, so will the state follow it or will the state not follow it? That decision has not been made yet, but the guidance was that all facilities need to have baseline testing. That means all the residents and all their staff need to be tested before they open. So I want you to have that situational awareness that that is the CDC guidance at this point. Um, the decision to do this at the state level was just, we, we, and as a provider, I want that baseline. I want to know who's positive. I know the value of identifying asymptomatic positives and getting them out of the uh, environment as quickly as possible. And I know the value that is on the community because they're at home quarantining and they're not out. I know the value that is for their families. A lot of our folks are living in multi-generational family situations and they, and or, or they themselves have autoimmune disease or members of their family have immunodeficiencies. So it's just really important information for our facilities, for our communities, for our families. It affects everyone. And so that's really why I am so proud that that is our decision moving forward. I was gonna be done, but Kim is quickly scrambling something on a piece of paper, <laughs> so I'm gonna wait. Um, the deer did make it across the road, for those of you that were worried. <laughs> I was worried. Um, oh yes, there is gonna be a ribbon on our website about testing. So, um, and I know we've worked directly with our po providers that have had positive test results and hopefully my goal is to really work, get that testing out, get test, baseline testing out for them as quickly as we can possibly next week or over the course of the next three weeks. Um, I, my goal was Friday, but that was, I tend to set really high goals that I can't meet. That's good, you know, because then you keep working for them. So that's, I'm okay with that. But um, testing, 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 I can't say it enough. Also can't say enough again. Thank you for all that you guys are doing out there. I know our jobs are getting tougher. Um, and I know that there's a lot of different information floating around there. So I appreciate you uh, taking the time to listen to us every week as we try to keep you as up to date as we can. Please enjoy your Memorial Day weekend. Remember the reason for the holiday. Um, and thank you for all you do. Have a good weekend.